it says it's 1014. I made an agreement last week that I was going to speak quickly. Well, not, I already do that part. Speak brief, well, that I wouldn't talk as long. That's what I mean. <laughs> I already talk really fast. So it wasn't about speeding up what I had to say. It was about making it condensed to make sure we had time for social hour and to start our concert pr promptly at noon. And now you know why with that dulcet voice. So I am going to be really attentive to that as I proceed. So here we go. Now, today's the, the month theme is living, loving, and learning. And today's talk was actually inspired by this movie screening we had on Friday night. It turned out to be kind of a private screening, which was kind of cool. And we screened the 2004 New Thought movie classic, What the Bleep Do We Know? So today's topic title is What the Belief Do We Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll, it'll roll on you, and you, it'll grow on you as you get there. You know, again, just see it in print. What the belief do we know? Well, we're going to try and find out. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the film, it's really about quantum physics and how it applies scientifically and spiritually into who we are. And so I went back to my favorite, second favorite. Well, the dictionary is my first book. Science of Mind would be second. What is quantum physics? It is the study of the behavior of matter and energy at the molecular, atomic, nuclear, and even smaller microscopic levels. So then, okay, so what does quantum mean? Quantum comes from Latin meaning how much. It refers to the discrete units of matter and energy that are predicted by and observed by quantum physics. So all that fancy stuff says is at a sub-nuclear level as well as externally really we're one, hello, spiritual concept many of us have heard before. And what this film, this um, interesting film, began to tell us and show us, and that's one of the beauties of film, is that it gives you the graphics. It's not just somebody standing up here talking at you. It's not you just reading. You've got all of the senses, all the kinesthetics working to get a visual and audio and, and a visceral experience of what they were talking about. How many of you have seen the film? Well, that's most of you. So that's why you didn't show up on Friday night, huh? <laughs> well, we as I said, we kind of had a private screening, and it was quite wonderful, because I had not seen the film since it was originally released in 2004. And I was quite intrigued by how much of it, it was like, yeah, 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 uh-huh, duh. And then how, of it, how much of it I went, oh, right, yeah, oh, I forgot that part. Oh, that's a great way to, to put it. Oh, and visually what they did. So two things that that caught my eye differently in watching the film this time was there's a huge section about Dr. Emoto in it, which I had completely forgotten. And for the past two weeks, I had been talking about uh, Mr. Dr. Emoto and the hidden messages in water and talking about how he had done those experiments of placing certain words taped onto vials of water and then photographing the water molecules and looking at the difference. And then the water molecules, molecules with harsh words like hate and war showed up with really frenetic, unpleasant photographic images, whereas the water in vessels that had words like love and joy and peace on it showed up more like snowflakes. And in the film, Marley Matlin, the protagonist, is walking down sort of like a subway area and this docent has giant pictures of that and is explaining that to her. And I thought it was extraordinary to be able to see it and to hear it differently again instead of me telling you, I was listening to, oh my gosh. And then Sherman Armament, some of you probably know him because he went on to being in the Star Trek thing. He's this little gentleman and he came in and he kept haunting her with the phrase, if thoughts can do that to water, imagine what thoughts can do to us. And they kept playing that over and over again. And that's what I was trying to say was that since we're, our bodies are about 90% water, that if the thoughts that get projected onto a, a mundane neutral glass of water can change the molecular structure, those thoughts that we project out into the world to our fellow human beings who are 90% water or to ourselves as 90% water, think about what they're doing for us. So when our thoughts are on all the time, and sometimes it sounds or feels like, you know, Homer Simpson's at the, the machine, and the thoughts are coming through, and they're, they're negative, and they're cranky, and they're stupid, and they're clunky, and you're not paying any attention, or you come on a Sunday morning, and suddenly it's like, 
ah, oh, thoughts, um, and, and you begin to have all the thoughts that we talk about, teach, read, and do. And so our water little molecules are really happy, and we start to vibrate that way, and we go out there, and then as the day goes on, we forget. So I got inspired by the film again, and there's a, a lovely scene as the protagonist is sort of getting it, you know, about how she's creating a reality instead of being this snarky, grumpy, angry, bitter divorcee, she's suddenly seeing the difference, right? Well, there's this wonderful scene where she goes into her bathroom and she has this rage attack at herself in the mirror. You know, she's just so fed up with her life, her body, her world, blah, blah, blah. And then something shifts and she gets this idea and she starts taking something and a pencil and adorning her body with flowers and symbols and lovely things that, that, you know, evoke this. And she has this wonderful visceral experience and then she gets in the tub and then you see her and she is completely surrounded by all of these wonderful things. <laughs> Don't try this at home. <laughs> You know, th I should know better, coming from Hollywood, that of course, you know, you've got artists on the other side painting and drawing for you. And, oh yeah, see I have little flowers on my knees. I have other words and things in places you don't get to know about. But because I didn't have the, the smarts to take Christine's class on Saturday, it starts with the circle, I'm not even sure how my teaching symbol circle worked, and so I had to evoke assistance from my beloved husband to, and handed him a makeup pencil to draw things. I said, well, write, write words, write love. And it says joy, it says joy, and we're, uh, you know, you're doing things. And I don't know, John Birch, for tax things, do I get to write off all the makeup pencils that I used to, to display this today? But I mean, went through several um, eyeliner pencils today to do this. Now, in some ways, this is goofy and silly. And in other ways, this is what I, one of the things that I get to do for you. I get to role model and demonstrate this. And, um, and you know, well, am I going to walk around? We couldn't try, we were trying to figure out words that would fit under the sleeves and what we were going to do. And, and I have symbols. And, and I was thinking about it and having great fun. But I have to confess to you, being the former Catholic girl, that when I got the inspiration to do this this morning and then was starting to draw, I guess I didn't really pay too much attention to the film because part of my impulse was to immediately write tall, skinny, thin. <sighs> and as funny as that is, what it taught me immediately was I still have work to do. Much as the protagonist, as Marley Matlin did when she looked in the mirror. When she looked in the mirror in the film, you know, the, again, Hollywood techniques, I mean, they magnified her to like this size, right? You know, she was like this and so this. But in her head, and what she saw was ten times the size. Which was part of that anger and rage that finally moved through her until she decided no and then began to adorn her body with words and symbols, et cetera, et cetera. And, and when I went to do this and I immediately went to, and I wanted to go, skinny. Oh, I guess I didn't get it, did I? Because if I'm trying to impose words and thoughts and feelings and not the ones that are nature, that, that, that wasn't maybe the most positive word for my 90% of water to hear. So I thought I had a lesson this morning all by myself <laughs> that I thought I would Im slightly embarrass. I just realized, oh my God, this is going to be on YouTube, isn't it? <sighs> okay. Okay. You know, public figures get to do things differently. And um, Dr. Michael Beckworth used to teach us about you kind of have to grow up publicly in front of the world. But it used to be just your community. Then, of course, the Internet came in. And that's, I guess, what I did. So, now, not to get too much more personal on that, what I want to do is also mention quickly that in the film, one of the other things that I had forgotten about was that there was a gentleman, one of the talking heads and experts in the film, was Dr. Andrew Newberg, who is one of the co-authors of the book we talked about last week, Words Can Change Your Brain. 
and is also one of the co-columnist journalists in the Monthly Science of Mind magazine that we talk about. And he has this column with, with um, Mr. Waldman that talks about exactly, in miniature form, everything that this film talks about changing the molecular structure of your being to match the spiritual structure so that you're vibrating and expressing the world that you want, which is, I think, I haven't taken Sandy's class, but the power of your word. If those words, whether we artistically adorn them on our bodies or we're speaking them aloud in nonviolent communication to one another, if those words are so significant, we need to have power, empower ourselves to be choosing the right words. And then we get to come into those that need to understand it. You know, I told you last week I wanted to wear a white lab coat, and that's what I was going to wear today, but I don't own a white lab coat. To say that we're talking about these things in quantum physics, in medical science, Larry Dossi, um, this gentleman, and including uh, physicist David Bohm, who says the universe may be nothing more than a giant hologram created by the mind, that we're talking about the brain being one of our best tools to transformation. So we've got the book, Words Can Change Your Brain. We've got D Dr. Johnny is going to be teaching her brain class again for us later in the year. We have tools by which we can understand the molecular structure of our brains to engage them into assisting us to express on a better level. And then Sherry Lyne Coyle in the bookstore said, oh, well, from last week's talk, well, of course you know about Greg Braden's book, which let me make sure I have that right, The Spontaneous Healing of Belief, Shattering the Paradigm of False Limits. And I went, no, I don't know about that. She, had, she bought it at the book sale. So she loaned it to me, and I was, I'm eating it up. I already ordered another copy so I can have mine, because I don't like to underline other people's books. I don't know. It's funny. <sighs> but I have to underline and put the little post-it notes and do things. And, and Mr. Braden, who many of you are familiar with, he's written tons of metaphysical, quantum physical books, really has this idea. He's got several belief codes that he feels we need to begin to adopt to assist us in expressing this idea on a natural natural basis. So then I decided, okay, I was getting into the brain stuff and it sounded very current and heady. So I went back to Buddha, who says, do not believe in anything simply because you have heard it. Do not believe in anything simply because it's spoken or rumored by many or merely on the authority of your teachers and elders or ministers. But after observation and analysis, when you find that anything ag that agrees with reason, then accept it and live up to it. Yes. So the Eastern mystics are matching the Western physics and saying the same thing. The thing that intrinsically we all know about our oneness, our wholeness, our unity. And here we are, just these people, you know, stumbling along on the planet, trying to find that out viscerally for ourselves, as well as express it in the world around us. And we, we keep looking for outside people, or things, or, or, or programs, or anything that we can, that's going to give it to us. That's going to be the answer and fix it. And if we take this course or if we buy this book or we spend this amount of money and we do all this, we go on a retreat, then we'll have it, won't we? Well, yes and. Those are all valuable. They all add to the spiritual growth and the process and the understanding, which is why there are so many books written and so many speakers because we can't hear it just from one person. We need it in the different voices and dialects and, and understanding so that we grok it on our own level. And the idea being, we really have it all right here, right here, to make the difference that we seek, to do exactly what Dr. Holmes talked about, about changing the thinking, which means the brain, which means the words that we use in order to change our life. Soren Kierkegaard says, there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. The other is to refuse to believe what is true. So both the Bleep film and Greg Braden's book really ask a very powerful mm -hmm. question. Can we handle the truth that we have asked ourselves to discover? Sometimes the answer to that is no. 
Can we handle the truth that we have asked ourselves or put ourselves on this spiritual path to discover? We become so emboldened and so almost, you know, prodigal son, daughter-ish, and we, we embark on that path, and then we get out there, and we're trucking, and maybe we got a few parking places, and we do a few things, and oh, that works out for us, and oh, yeah, maybe even won a little bit on that lottery or something, and then suddenly we come across something in our life, and it's like, <laughs> well, I thought I handled you. Well, that was, that was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Why are you still dogging me? And now why are you up again? And then, boom. And we walk into something that we haven't dealt with. We walk face into something that's difficult. We walk into a time where we realize, oh, maybe I'm not walking my talk, or maybe I'm not practicing what I think I'm practicing, because otherwise, whoop, wouldn't be showing up in front of me. And then that kind of bobbles us, and we lose our footing just a little. And then we reach out, and we stumble, and we grope. And what we need to do is come back to that full realization that we talk about, and we go to belief code number one that Greg Braden talks about. And he says, experiments show that the focus of our attention changes reality itself and suggests that we live in an interactive universe. Well, if you've done any physics, you know that that's kind of like Schrodinger's cat. You, what you do, what you observe, makes a difference. Your observing something is going to change the experience. So then you have to ask yourself, well, who's the observer? What's being observed? Oh. We just observed that. We shared in that child's discomfort. We observed that. But who, what, is observing that? Who, what, within us had that empathy about that? I myself, we, we, I even went, oh, you know, to that child. So what is that within us? And we change that. So we are all each the observer and the observed. Observed and the observee. Observer and you get it. He doesn't say that part. That's me trying to understand it. So we create our realities. Human belief, human belief, which equals thoughts and emotions, create our beliefs, then our actions, then our experiences. This is all basic science of mind. So if that is the case, and there are things that are out here that are difficult or unpleasant to handle, then it becomes our charge to kind of roll things back, look within, and start to change the thoughts to change the feelings. Because sometimes thoughts, or we experience thoughts preceding feelings, sometimes we, we experience feelings preceding thoughts. And then the beliefs come out, and then if we have a belief in something, sure enough, we're going to manifest it out here, aren't we? And then we go, well, there it is. There it is. There's proof. And now we have a new belief. And we've just kind of sprayed it over with gloss. And what we need to do is rewind and come back to the intrinsic truth of who we are, the quantum physics truth of who we are, and mostly the spiritual truth of who we are. Belief code number two in Mr. Braden's book. We live our lives based on what we believe about our world, ourselves, our capabilities, and our limits. Okay, so I'm asking who's the observer and, and who's the observed, and so the question then begs itself, are we seeing with our eyes or our brains? Think about that for a second. When you see something, is it your eye or your brain? Maybe it's the eye that's being the lens, if you will, but it's the brain that's sending the information about there's this person on the stage wearing a brown dress, da da da, -da. you know, all that stuff that you're seeing, you kind of filter it in. Yet, studies have shown that it doesn't have anything to do with that, that there's a higher order that's seeing. And they talk about this fabulous example in the film about Christopher Columbus when he arrived to the, the Native Americans, or to the Native land. And they said that when the boats started coming, and the boats didn't go very fast in 1492, but as the boats started coming, no one on the island could identify them I didn't, I don't mean just identify them going, hmm, whose boats are those? They didn't see the boats because they'd never seen a boat. They had nothing in their brain to equate with a boat. They didn't have a belief in boats. They didn't have a belief in 
aliens and intruders and voyagers. <laughs> they didn't know that. And it wasn't until the shaman was out at the shore and, and had begun to notice the rippling of the waves on a consistent basis that didn't match. And so being shamanist, he probably stood there for a while, meditated on it, and then suddenly the focus shifted and he was able to see the ships coming towards him. I just thought that was like the coolest thing. Oh my gosh. So who saw? The eyes or the brain? What shifted in the observance and the observer? So when we see things, are we seeing them? Are you from Missouri? Show me the show me state. Yeah, I got to see it to believe it. Wayne Dyer is the one that said, you, I need to believe it before I see it. So what we do is we see with our eyes and our heads and we expect, we influence, that's the physics part, we influence what we're about to see. So if Marley Mat Matlin in the film saw herself as five stories wide, that's what she saw and she kept believing that and doing that. She kept seeing negative situations and cranky people. And the film shows goofy things to, to kind of endorse that. But then she began to see differently, which is what we get to do is to see differently. And as we begin to see differently, what we're charged to do is not only see, but speak and think and act differently. Be the change you want to see in the world. Thank you, Mr. Gandhi. We need to do that in order for our lives to change, for our bodies to change, for our set of ex ex uh, circumstances to change. Werner Heisenberg says, atoms are not things, they are only tendencies. Atoms are not things, they're only tendencies. This is borderline for A Course in Miracles, for those of you who know that, where everything is illusory and imaginary in a way. Matter doesn't matter, which is a real hard one to, to, to wrap around because you're standing here and you're going, well, that's a podium, those are flowers, I have a bracelet. But it doesn't matter, that's not matter. No, it's an expression of what I think, believe, and see. And then what happens, much like the shaman and the natives, you start to say, oh, well, you, well, there's a bracelet. Well, yes, 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 it's a bracelet. Don't you agree? It's a bracelet. Whoops. Nine out of ten people agree it's a bracelet. We now have a bracelet. So what we do, and this is, so, this is that goofy thing about being human, what we do, we elicit commiseration from those around us to agree with the things that we really don't even want to agree with. The negativity, the government, the weather, the money, the economy, our health, that's another big one. And so it's like, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, I agree with you. Oh, you think that's bad? Well, did you hear about? And then we start building on that and we have a whole new reality out here. We have a whole new belief code, most of which uh, we don't want to believe in, yet we do it. It's kind of somewhat of the human nature, the human animal. But we have these wonderful people whether you go back as far as somebody like Buddha, or you go back to Dr. Holmes, or you come to someone like Braden or Dr. Newberg and all of that, who are saying the same thing in different ways to our Western current ears so that we may hear it and learn. How am I doing on time? <gasps> Good, okay. <laughs> belief code number five. Our beliefs have the power to change the flow of events in the universe, to literally interrupt and redirect time, matter, and space and the events that occur within them. Our beliefs have the power to change the flow of events in the universe, literally to interrupt and redirect time, matter, and space, and the events that occur within them. Really? Wow. I mean, I grew up with certain belief systems that I either got or were inherited that certain things don't change, and it's definitive, and certainly you can't change your DNA. Wrong. We now are changing the very DNA nucleic structure of who we are by using our thoughts, our words, our actions, knowing and being in consciousness by being the observer and the observed and then surrendering all of that to that which doesn't see so that it's more about what we know. It's who we be. That I'm making sense? I know it gets, it get, you get, so Dr. Braden, or, yeah, I don't think he's a doctor. Hmm. I don't remember his credits. This guy who wrote a lot of books, makes sense. 
Greg Braden says, the world is nothing more and nothing less than a reflection of what we believe both as individuals and collectively, consciously, and subconsciously. Hmm. I will read that again. The world, meaning the exterior life that we see, the world around us, our own world and our homes, our cars, our workplace, the world, our Chico community, our United States of America, the Milky Way, the world... The world is nothing more and nothing less than a reflection of what we believe both as individuals and collectively, both consciously and subconsciously. Gulp. I don't know about you, but there are a lot of people out there thinking things that I don't agree with. <laughs> so I have to be really clear about what I do believe in and what I do agree and do the work subconsciously and consciously so that I am in congruence with my thoughts, my feelings, my desire, and my grand O capital high observer self. So that I am using the words that can change my brain, change my life. So that I am living it from the feeling nature and creating new belief systems. And so that as I'm able to do that, Instead of a bunch of us commiserating at the water cooler about what isn't possible or what's wrong, I am moving over to a different water cooler about what is right and what is possible, and then 100 monkeys will, will clamor around me and start to do that, and hopefully one of those 100 monkeys will go over here and do another 100 monkey, and we will start making that difference that we talk about, that we seek, that sometimes we go to protests and marches for, that we buy books to understand, that we come to a spiritual community to share and understand and be together in this and create a new vibration to awaken to our spiritual magnificence, to work for a world that works for everyone, not just for people who have some key ideas or certain finances or certain jobs, but really come into that collective consciousness of the higher order of who we are. That's what all of this is about. Greg Braden, What the Bleep, the movie I Am, The Secret, which we're going to watch at the end of the month. Again, one of those classic ones that, well, The Secret did amazing things to people suddenly flocking to new thought centers. Really? This is what you guys think? A lot of it? Yeah. yeah. And then I'll go back to Buddha. Buddha's quote about don't believe in anything simply because you've heard it or because you read it in a book or because Reverend Hoody Wadi Who said it, but believe it because it intrinsically, viscerally connects to the higher order of who you are, the truth in your being, where you vibrate that. And you all, I absolutely can, you know, we're not supposed to make generalizations about we. I know that we have each had that feeling of connection, that oneness, that... Yes, that mystical moment. Sometimes it's elusive and brief, and sometimes we try and, you know, scramble like catching mercury. Come back, come back, Shane. I want to feel that again. And that's why we keep coming back to this idea. We want this. I know we have that we've all felt that. I just feel it's really time we did that. And watching the movie again Friday night reminded me, oh, I'm still talking about it. Where in my life am I not doing it? So I have areas that I still have to attend to. <laughs> and then I get to come here and share it with you and be that monkey, 101th month monkey, standing at the water cooler of Chico New Thought Center with pure clear water of infinite truth trickling into our cup to drink from that and remembering that that water at the water cooler vibrates to my thoughts and thinking. So I do not want to go to the collective metaphoric water cooler and talk about how rotten it is, how bad things are. Yeah, I don't want to do that. I had opportunities this weekend to do that. Certain things, I didn't, I had an okay day on Friday the 13th. I don't have a thing about it being unlucky. Yesterday I had my altercation with a recycling bin, which was... <laughs> Painful, but okay, you get an ice pack and you start over. I, it, I, it doesn't, Rick and I were talking, he said, oh, another green incident. And I was like, no, no, I'm still going to recycle. <laughs> it's all right. I don't take, I'm not taking it personally from the recycling bin. So there are 
times everywhere where we get to humanly respond. And then I come back. And then I think about balance. And I think about creation. We were going to put creativity. It would have been too long. I think about joy. I think love comes down here. I think about my teaching symbol. I think about whatever things are Don wrote on my back, which I'll have to look at when I get home. And I think about that. And I'm going, yes, yes, I want every molecule of my water in my being to vibrate to those. And if I have to start over with a shower of forgiveness and release so that the new water that pours down upon me is one of balance and joy and creativity and love, then so be it. And we get to do that together by means of this community or a movie or a book or a class or a meditation or beautiful music that calls to us, that sings to us. That's how you know the truth. There is a vibrational match. A vibrational match. You know it intuitively. It isn't always here. It isn't always the, oh, mushy, mushy. It's the whole instrument. Now, honoring my commitment and my charge to do this briefly, and because there's just like a gazillion things more to say, this is not a small topic, we will continue with What the Belief Do You Know, part two, next Sunday. Means you have to come back. And you're, you're more than welcome to come back. There's just too much to share in one day. And if I get into any more, I know I'll go over time. And I really want us. Plus, this is big stuff. This, it's big stuff. I mean, it's really kind of basic and simple. But it's big stuff. I'm telling you that you have everything you need right now to change your life. Everything you need. That goes back to that first question or that question that, that they say, can we handle the truth that we have asked ourselves to discover? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And that's why we come here together to do it together so that nobody has to do it alone, that we're all alone together, all alone, all one, back to the subnucleic vibration that unites us, how we are one. So if you're asking yourself any of these questions or are the basic that I'm talking about, how, can, you should be sending yourself waves of gratitude and appreciation that you had the smarts to come here this morning so that you would know the confirmation that you need to proceed to transform your life. And in so transforming your life, transform the lives of others, which is what we are about. This center and most centers of spiritual living in one way or another. So what the belief do we know? Hmm. It's almost a rhetorical question because you already know and you don't need to define it for me. You simply need to define it for yourself. Let's go within. For a moment, just visualize yourself as a beautiful decanter of clear, pure water. Maybe a beautiful vase or a glass or a, like a wine decanter. Some wonderful, clear vessel in which the water of your being is contained. And if you're really good at visualization, maybe you see that vessel on a beautiful table with some wonderful tablecloth and the sun's rays streaming in. Or maybe it is pure and simple and it's just there right before you. So open, so receptive, so innocent and true. And what, so whether your vessel of water is grandiose and detailed and artistic or simple and pure and true, be with it for one moment and know that that vessel that you're looking at contains the essence of who you are. And then begin to, in your mind's eye, either see it or just affirm it and begin to attach words, qualities of God to that. Love, peace, joy, abundance creativity, wholeness, balance, 
order, joy again. And let it swirl around there and let the, the absolute atoms and, and neurons and nucleuses and all those scientific things that are contained within the water as you begin to vibrate in happy recognition and remembrance of who you truly are. And then begin to feel yourself refreshed as if you had had the chance to drink of that clear, pure water and it refreshes and hydrates you. And know with me that some word, some note of music, some smile of a fellow person here today, some of those things or all of those things add it to the expansion of your being today to affirm and confirm your wholeness right here, right now. Yes, I know that some of us will walk out the door today and then something will happen and we'll kind of frumph again. It might deflate or the water will start to trickle out. It, that may happen. But refill it now so you get a clear idea that you are always at the wellspring of infinite truth and by which you bring a giant or a glorious, graceful vessel and not just a thimble to drink of the water of your truth, your nature, your wholeness. And drink that in. Let it just saturate your being. And if you're not visual, that's okay. Just affirm and know it. Your intention is hugely powerful in this. If you're someone who doesn't see visual images, that doesn't mean you're not getting this. Just know it. Affirm it. And then we join together in a conscious knowing together that there is only the life of God and that life of God is who I am and is the life of God is that represented water vessel. And as I speak this spiritual mind treatment in the first person, I do so that you may hear it and speak it from within yourself. To know that I am that I am and that great life of spirit is my life now and that I accept my wholeness, my totality right here and right now with no disclaimers, no yeah but, right here, right now in the safety, the perfection and the power of this gathering, I claim my wholeness, my good, my beauty, my abundance, my health. And I know that as I claim it for myself, I make it possible for anyone else to claim it, name it, and accept it. That's my charge. That's how I serve and support others. And then it extends to overflowing, spontaneous acts of kindness to others and to myself. And then it just snowballs into the greater glory of God that we know as our lives right here, right now. And oh, for that I am so grateful. Mm. So I now lovingly, enthusiastically, joyously, and again, gratefully, just release this. The words that have been spoken, the wisdom from these other people that I have shared, the process that each of us have had where we have touched this, and the full recognition of each of us individually being able to vibrate and resonate to our truth. Capital T, truth. Not just the facts, ma'am. Thank you, spirit. Thank you, life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Gratitude. Gratitude was one of the prettiest snowflakes of water molecules that Dr. Emoto photographed. Thank you. Just think about that. As you say thank you, how your entire body just responded. And with that now, I lovingly and humbly release it. I let it be. Please join me together as we say, and so it is, and so I am, and so we are. Amen. <coughs>